Good evening, everyone. Thank you all for taking some time to uh, join us on this really beautiful uh, summer evening. Uh, tonight, we'll be discussing some common foot and ankle conditions. Uh, more specifically, uh, some of the more common foot and ankle conditions that we see during the summer. We'll go over what some of these uh, conditions are, their signs, their symptoms, some treatment options, and some prevention tips. Uh, my name is Brian Reed. I am a uh, podiatrist with Orthopedic Associates of Dutchess County. I am board certified in foot surgery and board certified in reconstructive rear foot and ankle surgery. Uh, I have uh, been uh, practicing in the Hudson Valley for a little over 20 years and I have a passion for these summer outdoor activities. So this is, an act, this is a, uh, a topic I really enjoy talking about. Uh, so I'll start by giving a talk on some of these conditions for about 15 or 20 minutes. Um, and, and then at that point, we'll open up for uh, some uh, questions and answers um, uh, that any of you may have. So uh, again, I'll go over some of the most common things that we see and certainly um, hopefully I address some of the things that uh, you're looking to hear. And if not, certainly we'll uh, address those in a, in a question and answer uh, session uh, following the talk. So again, uh, we're now in the season where the weather uh, is nice and where we tend to get out a little bit more and do these fun recreational uh, and athletic activities. I think this year, uh, even more so is with the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, everybody's really been feeling the, the effects of uh, being locked down and uh, really chomping at the bit uh, to get out and uh, get into some activity. At least that's what I've been seeing over the past couple of weeks of my practice, a, a, a spike or an increase in walking, jogging, hiking, cycling, golfing, and some, some other fun recreational summer activities. Next slide. So I, you know, it's great that we're out there doing that, increasing our activities uh, during the season. It's well known uh, that increased activity has many important health benefits. Uh, it has positive effects on brain health. It's clearly linked to uh, decreased uh, depression, decreased anxiety. It's a great form of weight management. Uh, it's been uh, known to decrease heart disease and stroke. Uh, it's also been known to improve bone strength and health. And it's also been known to uh, increase our life expectancy. Um, so these are all great positive things of getting out and leading an active lifestyle. Uh, but as we start to increase our activity, uh, there is also some increased risk of injuries and uh, conditions that we see during the, during the summer months. Next slide. So probably the number one um, or the most common cause of um, or, or overuse syndrome in the foot is plantar fasciitis. Uh, it's common with any type of impact activity, such as hiking, jogging, and walking. The plantar fascia is a big, broad ligament uh, that runs along the bottom of the foot and functions to support the arch. If you look at that uh, image here on the right side, let me try to see if I can mark on this screen. Uh, this right here is the tibia or the le leg bone. Uh, this is the heel bone right here, this funny shaped bone. Uh, these are the toes out here. And this big, broad ligament that runs along the entire bottom of the foot is called the plantar fascia. It's just a big broad fascia band that runs on the plantar aspect or the bottom of the foot. Um, as we weight bear and do activity, uh, the arch flattens to help support your body weight uh, and the plantar fascia should stretch and allow your arch to flatten down a little bit for some shock absorption. But with certain activity, that plantar fascia becomes very tight uh, and doesn't stretch. So it becomes very inflamed and painful uh, with weight bearing. Uh, plantar fasciitis can occur anywhere along uh, that plantar fascia band or ligament, but most notably uh, or most commonly, it occurs uh, as pain on the bottom of the heel. And uh, we have this term we call it, this called post static dyskinesia, uh, which is the most common early sign of plantar fasciitis. And that means that uh, you have pain after rest. Uh, typically, the longer the rest, the more intense the pain. So early on in the course of plantar fasciitis, it's typically very painful when you weight bear uh, uh, first steps out of bed in the morning. Uh, next slide. So the initial treatment options for plantar fasciitis is stretching and arch supports. Um, the, the plantar fascia is an extension of the calf musculature and uh, runs along the back and then extends onto the bottom of the foot. So uh, uh, 
we call posterior muscle group stretching exercises or calf and Achilles stretches are really helpful in alleviating early symptoms of plantar fasciitis. Um, arch supports are also important to help support that band or that ligament uh, from straining and stretching on the bottom of the foot. Um, Anti-inflammatory medications such as Aleve, Motrin, Ibuprofen um, are often uh, helpful as well. So if you have some heel pain or a little pain in your arch that uh, seems to be uh, just starting and it hurts when you first get out of bed in the morning or anytime you bear weight after a period of rest, uh, it, it's totally acceptable to maybe start self-treating for plantar fasciitis. Do some good stretching, uh, have some arch supports, and if there's no, if you don't take blood thinners or have any allergies or other conditions um, that uh, are contraindicated, you take some over-the-counter leave, Motrin, ibuprofen, those things are uh, helpful early on. For more difficult cases, um, you may need some prescription anti-inflammatory medication or even a cortisone injection uh, are, are quite helpful in reducing the inflammation and pain associated with plantar fasciitis. Um, also, a formalized physical therapy regimen is also quite effective for plantar fasciitis. They could just do more uh, vigorous stretching, massage, ultrasound, electric stimulation, and modalities uh, like that that can help uh, the inflammation uh, and eradicate plantar fasciitis. Next slide. Another very common uh, overuse syndrome that we see as people become more active is Achilles tendonitis. Uh, the Achilles tendon is the largest tendon in the body. It connects the upper calf muscle uh, to the back of the heel bone, and it functions to flex uh, the ankle, which is pointing the toes in a downward position. Uh, tendons, in general, the anatomy of tendons is that they get their blood supply or their nutrition from the muscle that they originate from and from the bone that they attach to. And the Achilles tendon is such a long tendon uh, that it, it has an area in the middle that's devoid of, uh, or of a good blood supply. And we call that area of the Achilles tendon the watershed area. And that's where it's really vulnerable uh, to injury. So this is the calf muscle. Um, and this is the back of the heel bone here. And again, this is just a long stretch of tendon here that the Achilles uh, is so long. And this area right in through here uh, is called the watershed area of the tendon where it tends to be uh, vulnerable to injury. Uh, so typically uh, Achilles tendonitis is pain right in that area, pain in the back of the ankle. Uh, typically Achilles tendonitis is painful when moving up and down, like uh, moving the ankle up and down. If it's your right side, it's painful when driving usually. Uh, also, it tends to be typically uh, painful uh, when going downstairs or walking on hills. Uh, many patients uh, notice a lump in that area of the Achilles tendon. Uh, and if that's happened or you notice that lump, you may have advanced past Achilles um, tendonitis to something called uh, Achilles tendinosis. And if you notice that lump in the back of the, uh, of the ankle area, that's something you really want to get into the doctor's office and get treated um, because that thickening, attendant, thickening of the tendon uh, is uh, an elevated risk uh, for an Achilles uh, tendon rupture. Next slide. Achilles tendonitis and plantar fasciitis, uh, again, are very similar uh, um, because they are both extensions of the plantar fascia and the Achilles tendon are both extension uh, of the calf musculature. So the treatment's very similar, rest, ice, anti-inflammatory medications. Um, we typically uh, use heel lifts uh, uh, in treating Achilles tendonitis. If you look at this image here um, on the left, the length that the Achilles tendon has to stretch to reach the ground. Uh, and if you put a heel lift in, you effectively shorten that distance that the Achilles tendon has to travel, thereby relaxing it and, and decreasing uh, uh, pain and inflammation. Uh, for Achilles tendon, that just Achilles tendon can be very painful, and when it is, we put uh, we can put people into what's called a cam walker. That's that black boot on the upper right side there. Uh, cam walker stands for controlled ankle motion walker, and we use it for a variety of ankle uh, injuries. Um, but uh, it's very effective in, in treating painful Achilles tendonitis. And usually it's not a long course of immobilization. Uh, depending on the severity, usually it's somewhere around two weeks of immobilization with the cam walker. Physical therapy is also very helpful for um, Achilles tendonitis. There's a specific uh, training program called eccentric training uh, for the Achilles tendon. This is an example of an eccentric uh, stretch of the Achilles tendon here uh, on the bottom of the screen. Next 
Next slide. Stress fractures. Stress fractures are the classic um, doing too much too soon. So we see uh, these quite uh, often this time of year when people start to get out, uh, start new running programs or exercise programs after a, a period of being more sedentary during the winter months. Um, the two most commonly stress fractured bones uh, in the body are the tibia, which is the shin bone. Uh, it's the main shin bone right here. This bottom picture, this is the tibia right here. And typically it occurs uh, right above the ankle joint. Um, so pain, swelling above the ankle joint uh, can be a sign of a, uh, of a tibial stress fracture. Uh, of the second most commonly stress fractured bone in the body is the second metatarsal. Um, that's the long bone uh, right here that is adjacent to the, the first metatarsal. Now, although it's the most, second most common bone in the body that is stress fractured, this is an example of a third metatarsal stress fracture, uh, which, is, which is also um, uh, commonly uh, occurred uh, stress fracture. Um, stress fractures are not the same as an occult fracture. An occult fracture where we uh, fall, you break a bone, um, and we clearly see that on x-ray. Um, stress fractures, because it's a slow process of weakening of the bone, initially uh, x-rays uh, may be normal. As a matter of fact, they're quite often normal within the first uh, seven days to three weeks of the onset of symptoms. So if we have a, a pretty uh, high clinical suspicion that you may be you know, x-rays early on, um, might be negative. And the most common sign or symptom for you that you may be developing a stress fracture is usually swelling, pain, uh, and um, uh, often associated with bruising as well uh, in the area. Next slide. The <clears throat> treatment uh, for stress fractures uh, usually requires a period of mobilization. So unfortunately, if you develop a stress fracture, it's probably going to take you out of some of your activity for a period of time. Um, the earlier you treat stress fractures, the shorter that period can be. So getting on them right away, it may only be a week or two weeks of immobilization. Uh, if you neglect them and the stress fracture progresses and uh, occultly fractures through the bone, then you may need the full six weeks of uh, immobilization um, uh, to adequately, ad adequately treat the stress fracture. Uh, so even though it's a bummer if you develop a stress fracture that you have to be immobilized, these patients can cross train early. Um, patients who have stress fractures uh, are allowed to swim and cycle and do non-impact activity um, continuously uh, without uh, any downtime from those non-impact uh, exercises. Next slide. Ankle sprains. Ankle sprains are a extremely common injury. Up to 25% of all injuries that uh, report to the emergency department are ankle sprains. Uh, the most common ankle sprain is something called an inversion sprain, where we roll our ankle off to the outside. Um, and what happens in an ankle sprain is the strong ligaments that support the ankle stretch beyond their limits and uh, possibly tear. Uh, <clears throat> they occur in people of all ages, um, uh, and they range from mild to severe. And it's something, there's different grading systems for them, as you see there, um, uh, mild, moderate, and severe. Um, typically, you develop pain, swelling, bruising, and difficulty bearing weight. Thankfully, most ankle sprains are usually some uh, are minor sprains, uh, and they can heal on their own, and a little self-home treatment is perfectly acceptable of resting, icing, um, uh, taking some over-the-counter pain relievers like Tylenol or anti-inflammatories like ibuprofen, perfectly acceptable for mild ankle sprains. Um, however, if your ankle is really swollen, um, bruised, can't bear weight on it, that's signs of possibly a fracture or more high-grade sprains, and those uh, need to be seen and treated. Next slide. So again, the initial treatments, rest, ice, uh, compression, like an ACE bandage um, or um, elastic wrap, uh, and elevation. Um, some over-the-counter or uh, prescription bracing is also effective in helping for uh, mild uh, to moderate sprains. Um, but again, those more significant sprains where you're really swollen, bruised, can't bear weight, those need to be seen um, because you need, you need to get into a rehab program for those. When the ankle ligaments sprain or stretch or tear, 
they will tend to heal in that loosened position. If they heal in that loosened position, um, then you'll be something called a chronic ankle sprain where you always have a loose ankle and uh, be very unstable on uneven ground. So uh, if you have a more severe sprain, important to get into the rehab program, really train those ligaments to tighten back up and prevent recurrent sprains. Next slide. So those were really, I think that was four, those are four or five of the most common orthopedic or musculoskeletal foot and ankle conditions we see in the summer. Um, certainly if we have any questions later on on, on on something that might be bothering you, we can go over uh, however many more you'd like. Uh, but it's just gonna transition to some dermatologic or skin disorders that we also see uh, quite a bit uh, in the summer. <clears throat> the first are warts. Uh, a wart is a small growth on the skin. Uh, it develops when the skin is infected by a virus. Specifically, warts are caused by the human, uh, certain strains of the human papillomavirus or the HPV virus. Um, warts can develop anywhere on the foot, but they typically appear on the bottom or the plantar surface of the foot. So many people have probably heard the term plantar wart. Plantar just refers to the bottom of the foot. It's the anatomic location. And um, so plantar warts are just warts that occur on the bottom of the foot. Uh, and because they occur on the bottom of the foot, they often are painful. Uh, they're areas of pressure uh, and are painful. Uh, this, is, this top picture here is a very classic appearance of a wart. Almost looks like a callus. Um, and if you look closely, it looks like there's a callus here. And then you have like these little tiny black dots in the center of them. I get a lot of patients that come in and think uh, or say that they think they stepped on something, they think they have a splinter in their foot because you see these little black dots. That's a pretty classic finding in a ward. Uh, you can actually see them in this lower picture too. You see a uh, callous looking area and these little black dots. Those are tiny little blood vessels that supply the wart um, and it's a pretty typical sign uh, of a wart. Uh, so warts can occur um, as isolated small in, uh, uh, lesions, such as you know here and, and these small isolated lesions uh, here, or they be, can become more mosaic patterns, um, uh, and those tend to be a little bit more difficult to treat. And warts, again, because they are caused by a virus, they are contagious and, and, they, and they can spread. Next slide. So, there are many treatments available for warts, both over-the-counter and prescription treatments. Um, and some people feel like uh, because it's a virus, they don't need to be treated. Um, uh, and it is possible that warts go away on their own, uh, but I definitely do not advocate uh, not treating them. And the reason that I don't um, advocate treating them is because you can have one small isolated wart that can be quite easy to take care of and treat, and, um, and true that it may go away on its own, but also may worsen. So you don't want a small non-painful or minimally painful wart to develop one of those larger mosaic multiple lesion warts that are now painful and really difficult to get rid of. So I always advocate if you notice anything that looks like a wart, you should get it treated. And certainly similar to some of these other conditions, it's not terrible to just try some over-the-counter remedies for you know, a short period of a, a week or two weeks and see if it's helpful. And if it's not, then certainly come in and have it treated. There are a lot of different uh, uh, commercially available options over the counter. There's some cold therapy, there's some acid treatments and different types of agents. Um, but if that's not helpful, then you should uh, seek treatment and we can uh, easily uh, hopefully get rid of those. Uh, my um, personal preference is this top uh, screen here. This is uh, cryotherapy or freezing the warts. This is a canister of uh, liquid nitrogen. Um, it's really a non-painful treatment because if you look, it's really collimated. It comes out very thin stream and it's only on the wart of the surrounding skin and it's minus 127 degrees under pressure. So it's really, really super cold, freezes those virus cells and destroys them. Uh, it's a really effective treatment. Um, and if all else fails with the warts, they're tangible, they're on the surface. So you can do things to, to just get rid of them. Um, so this is a wart that might have just been too stubborn and was not going away with treatment. So you can simply um, just remove them. This is done very simply in the office setting, a little local anesthetic around the area, and you can remove the wart. Um, and you know, again, this is the summer season. We're talking about activities and getting out there and doing the things we, we enjoy uh, doing. Um, so 
after you have this removed, you can go back in the pool, beach, water, and, and do full activities. No downtime with having those removed. Next slide. Clear that picture there. There we go. So this is a pretty typical appearance of an ingrown nail. Um, ingrown nails uh, is when a nail is curved and grows into the skin, usually at the nail border. Uh, this digging into the nail irritates the skin, creates pain, redness, swelling, warmth, and you can see all those things, redness, swelling, well, you can't see the warmth, but you definitely see the redness, swelling, uh, and some drainage uh, in this area. This is a very uh, typical appearance of an, of an ingrown nail. This area along uh, the border right here, this red nail border, is usually very, very painful uh, to direct touch. When it's not touched, it usually doesn't hurt, but banging or bumping it or uh, pressure from shoe gear uh, is very painful. We see this a lot in the summer um, uh, in, with uh, increased activities like kicking and soccer and hiking. Anytime there's a lot of repetitive pressure uh, on, on the toes. Next slide. Ingrown nails, um, you can try soaking it. You can try some over-the-counter topical antibiotic creams. Uh, certainly if you're in a jam and this is occurring on a, on a weekend or a Saturday evening or a Sunday, uh, soaking it uh, and some antibiotic ointment will help keep it at bay. Once you discontinue those things, it's going to come right back. And the reason it's going to come right back is the, the problem is still there, right? The, the corner of the nail is still ingrown. Um, so the treatment is to just remove that ingrown portion of nail. And that can be done temporarily, um, just trimming the, it can be very simple in minor ingrown nails, just trimming the, uh, the edge of the nail out. Or there's a very simple permanent procedure uh, that you can do just to remove that nail border. Uh, and the way we do that procedure, it's very simple in the office, just numb you up with a little Novocaine, we put a little Novocaine back here on the toe. And then we take, once the toe is nice and numb, we just remove this inside corner of the nail. Um, and when we remove that nail, we put a little medicine back here. It's an acid that cauterizes the nail root. So the remainder of the nail, this portion of the nail here will all grow back normal, but the ingrown portion here will never grow back again. And that has about a 99% success rate for never developing an ingrown nail again. So again, that's a really simple, um, it, it's a very, very simple in-office procedure. Uh, there's no downtime with that. I go right back in the pool, summer activities, um, uh, without uh, having to take any time out. Nail fungus. So I'm not really sure that nail fungus is something we um, summer causes or the summer activities cause, like most of these other conditions we're talking about. But I, it's certainly a complaint. Um, people tend to see their toenails more. They're exposed. They're in sandals and flip-flops and barefoot. Um, shouldn't be barefoot. We'll talk about that. Um, but they're just more visible. People are a little bit more self-conscious of them. Um, and they often come in complaining of uh, nail fungus. Uh, nail fungus is caused by an organism called, called a dermatophyte, which means by definition that organism can only su survive on the skin and the nail unit. So it can't spread to distant sites, cause any other internal infections, but it can spread to adjacent nails and cause multiple nails uh, to be involved. Um, the most common cause of nail fungus is an athlete's foot or a fungal rash that spreads to underneath the nail. Uh, also nail trauma. See it a lot in runners, hikers, you know, people, who, uh, fast walkers uh, from constant jamming of the toe in the shoe will cause the nail to lift a little bit. And then the fungal organisms that are really prevalent in our shoe gear and warm, dark, moist places um, will get in there and cause a nail infection. And yes, uh, unfortunately, they are contagious. So it can spread uh, from adjacent toenail to adjacent toenail, or it can also uh, spread within the household. Next slide. So there's a few different options for nail fungus. And it's, of all the things we're talking about today, believe it or not, nail fungus is probably the most stubborn or most difficult one to get rid of. Um, one perfectly acceptable um, option is no treatment at all. Uh, largely, nail fungus is a cosmetic issue. Uh, it's an infection, so it's not entirely cosmetic. But again, that, that organism can only survive on the skin and the nail. Um, so it really can't uh, cause other problems. Um, 
the main problem that it can cause, it can spread to adjacent nails, become a little bit more unsightly, but also it can cause the nail to become really thickened. And if the nail becomes really thickened, then you can have a little bit of pressure or discomfort uh, uh, with, with shoe gear. Topical antifungals are an option. Um, there's been, as you see up here, I've had, uh, I think, patients try every single one of these, lots of different options, Vicks Vapor Rub, vinegar, Listerine, tea tree oil. Um, I've, uh, I've heard most of these uh, and they just, they're, they're ineffective. I haven't really seen anything be, be effective, uh, long-term anyway. Um, topical antifungals, prescription topical antifungals are, um, are, are available. Uh, and topical antifungals um, <clears throat> are fairly ineffective. And the reason is, um, David, can you go back to the previous slide one second? The, the, the reason is uh, that the, the um, nail fungus is not an infection of the nail itself, it's a skin infection. So the, here's the nail plate right here, that little dot I just put on the screen. The nail fungus infects this skin underneath the nail here, the nail bed. So topical antifungals don't really penetrate through that nail plate and get to the source of the infection. So that's why topical antifungals are, are relatively uh, ineffective. Um, Dave, you go back to the following slide. Um, so uh, medical literature on the topical antifungals is about a 15% success rate. So fairly low. It's pretty tedious. You got to put them on every day, take them off. Um, every seven days and, and, and just, it's a lot of effort for uh, you know, small yield. Um, the other option is oral antifungal therapy. Oral antifungal therapy is far more effective, has about an 85 to 90% um, cure rate. Um, you do have to take one pill a day for 90 days. It's a three month course of medication. Um, it's a safe, it's an effective medication. There are some precautions uh, we take when you're on antifungal medications, doing blood work before you start and halfway through the three months. Uh, but uh, if you're healthy, active, you don't have a lot of other multiple medications, it is a very safe uh, and successful treatment option. There are some lasers that are also effective um, or being reported to be effective. Uh, previously had a laser uh, for nail fungus in one of my practices, and I just didn't find it super effective, usually not covered by insurance and usually um, uh, fairly pricey, but uh, there are some people who out there who are using laser therapy and reporting uh, some success. Next slide. Uh, so probably a little bit out of order. Probably could have talked about athlete's foot first and then the, the nail infection um, since... Uh, Athlete's foot usually causes the nail infection, but uh, super common in the, in the summer. Uh, athlete's foot is a fungal infection. It's caused by that same organism or dermatophyte that causes, um, <clears throat> that causes the nail fungus. Um, uh, early on, um, um, topical antifungal creams or topical sprays uh, can be effective. The problem with them are, is you may see that, that, that fungal rash return uh, once you've completed them because the uh, over-the-counter antifungals are something called fungostatic, meaning they inhibit fungal growth, but they don't kill the fungus. Um, uh, the prescription topicals are um, uh, what we call fungicidal, and they actually kill the, kill the, uh, uh, the fungus, and they're more effective. So uh, usually, almost always, very easily uh, cleared up with uh, topical antifungals. Um, you do want to clear it up, though, uh, especially people if you have diabetes or other um, systemic illnesses, because all of this cracking uh, here in between the toes, that can lead to superimposed bacterial infections. So people can get some pretty nasty bacteria infections because you have all those open cuts and sores in a, in a, in a contaminated area like your foot, and it can cause. Um, so you definitely want to, want to get the athlete's foot uh, cleared up. Next slide. So uh, puncture wounds, uh, I think this one's pretty self-explanatory. Puncture wounds um, are different than cuts. Cuts, scrapes, abrasions, they occur uh, quite a bit in the summer as well, but puncture wounds are not the same as cuts. A puncture wound is a small entry hole uh, by a pointed object, such as a nail that you stepped on. Uh, in contrast, uh, cuts and scrapes are um, open wounds that produce like a long tear in the skin. And that's important because the puncture wound usually goes in 
And, uh, and when it comes out, it seals pretty quickly. So these have a very high uh, infection rate because basically anything that's been out in the environment, a nail or any other pointed object, it basically you inoculate yourself, you basically introduce bacteria um, into this, into your, uh, into your foot. And then when the object is withdrawn, it leaves that bacteria in there, it quickly heals over and then an, an infection is kind of festering in there. So for a couple of reasons you want to, this is one of the things I don't recommend any self treatment for. If you have a puncture wound, you should come in uh, right away uh, for a couple of reasons. One is to make sure there's no retention of the foreign body, especially with wooden foreign bodies, they'll tend to splinter off or glass, you'll have small little shards of glass. Ordinarily with an object like a nail, you'll know that the whole nail came out. You, um, uh, but some of those other foreign bodies, glass or wood, there may be some splinters and retention of the foreign body that needs to be removed. Uh, but any um, substance that causes a puncture wound has a very high infection rate. So we typically start antibiotics uh, right away uh, for puncture wounds and follow them pretty closely to monitor for infection. Um, and obviously, um, the best way to avoid puncture wounds is by not going barefoot. Next slide. So um, in summary, um, you know, those were some of the most common things we see day in and day out in, in the summer months when people get really active. Um, just some basic general safety tips on avoiding some of these things. First is stretch. Most of those uh, musculoskeletal, if not all of them, uh, things we went over, plantar fasciitis, ankle sprains, stress fractures, Achilles tendonitis, um, they can all be avoided with just a good stretching regimen, being stretched out before and also stretching after uh, uh, your activity. Uh, certainly avoiding barefoot um, prevents things like warts, prevents things like foreign bodies, uh, puncture wounds, um, uh, athlete's foot. Uh, so uh, avoid being barefoot whenever possible. Um, Stay hydrated is important. Um, you know, uh, all the injuries that we talked about uh, earlier, the musculoskeletal injuries are all elevated uh, when you're dehydrated. The tissue is just less elastic uh, uh, when, you're, when you're dehydrated and more prone uh, to injury. Um, didn't really talk about it, it uh, but definitely use sunscreen. Don't neglect your feet when you, when you apply sunscreen to other areas. UV rays are equally as harmful on your feet and you can get some pretty nasty sunburns. Uh, when, when you're out uh, in the sun all day. And finally, just wear the uh, appropriate shoe gear for the appropriate, uh, oops, the appropriate shoe gear for the appropriate activity. I'm, I'm not the podiatrist who's going to condemn people for wearing flip-flops, um, but you definitely don't want to wear flip-flops when you're hiking. You don't want to wear, you know, uh, loose-fitting Crocs when you're gardening on a hillside. So you just want to wear the right uh, shoe gear uh, for the right activity. Thank you all for tuning in tonight uh, to listen to listen to this on this beautiful night. Um, it's my first time kind of doing this, so I'm gonna open up this chat room here a little bit and see if we have any questions and we could we can answer those. So I have one question here. When I stretch my feet, it feels like the tendons are tearing apart. What would cause this? And is there something I could do for this? So. Um, that sensation of tearing apart uh, is likely that you really just do need to stretch. I mean, um, people who are super tight uh, have that sensation. That's the, it, what you're doing when you're stretching that muscle unit. Uh, you're trying to lengthen it out. And if you're really contracted, um, then um, stretching uh, will, will give you that sensation. One of the things you can do to try to limit that is heat. Heat tends to kind of warm up the muscle unit before you, um, uh, before you stretch it. So stretching a cold muscle, if you're about to go on an activity, uh, you know, let's say for just for an example, you're gonna jog in the morning, get out of bed, have a cup of coffee and then start, you know, stretch in the jog. You know, you're stretching a cold muscle unit. So that it's gonna feel more like a stretching or, or tearing or um, uh, when you stretch. You should always stretch a warmed up muscle so it's good to go. Um, so it's good to uh, uh, stretch a warm muscle. You can heat it up a little bit, sometimes heating pad, warm shower, or sometimes just going out for a little bit of a walk and warming up the muscle first and then, and then uh, stretching after the muscle warmed up. Okay, hopefully that answered that question. Um, another question, since stress fractures don't show on x-rays, do you believe in using a tuning fork? It's a great question. Um, 
Uh, yes, I do. Um, uh, certain frequencies, uh, most commonly we use a 128 megahertz tuning fork. I'm not sure if that means anything or not, but uh, um, what, what's painful, <clears throat> what's painful in, in fractures, when people develop fractures, is when fractures move, they hurt. Uh, that's why when, the, when they heal, they don't hurt anymore. Uh, because there's no more motion at the fracture site. So um, when you apply the tuning fork to the area that is fractured, it'll cause some pain. Um, so it is a it is a way of diagnosing it. Um, it does have some some short shortcomings, and the shortcoming is that early on uh, there is no crack, there is no motion. It's just what we call marrow edema. Marrow edema is swelling within the bone. It's kind of when the stress fracture is first starting. So early stress fractures uh, won't be painful um, with a tuning fork either. So um, uh, if you're really concerned, if it's a competitive athlete, you can do some advanced imaging like an MRI um, uh, and they will show the stress fracture right away. Uh, but if it's a non-competitive athlete, um, uh, then the recommendation is you just treat it as if it is the stress fracture and then you reevaluate it in one week, uh, at which point if they're pain-free, it's likely not a stress fracture, uh, but at that one week evaluation, you re-X-ray. And at that point, if it's truly a stress fracture, you should see some, on, you should see some signs on plain X-ray by that point. Uh, another question. Uh, I stubbed my same small toe a few times over the years, and now the, there's a, a lump on the inside joint that sticks out to the side, maybe broken, worth fixing, I'm over 70, in good shape, and it doesn't bother me that much, just annoying. So um, I do, uh, thanks for your question. I think, again, really good question. Um, <clears throat> I, I'll just kind of answer it briefly and then uh, give you my reasoning. I would not do anything with it because uh, it doesn't hurt you. you know, you're, you're 70 years old, you're in good shape, you're, you know, you're doing activity, uh, why? come out of that activity, something's not bothering you. I'm, I'm, I'm a big proponent if it's not, the indication <clears throat> for foot surgery is pain, uh, largely. Um, uh, if you have pain and it's, it's preventing you from doing walking, if you told me I'm over 70, I was in great shape, and now this fifth toe is holding me up because I can't fit into my running sneakers and it really bothers me and I'm blistering all the time, I would recommend considering doing something so you can become active again. But if you're active and it's not really hurting you, I would just leave it alone. Um, simple silicon padding, if it irritates a little bit, wider, sh wider toe box uh, shoe, uh, things like that may even uh, make it so it's not annoying at all for you. Um, I have a question, and the gist of this one is, do I recommend any type of slippers to wear in the house? Some of the easy slippers tend to impede balance. I don't want to go barefoot. So uh, thanks for your question. Uh, kudos on not wanting to go barefoot. Um, uh, uh, there... I don't have a specific recommendation, and I always struggle with this. I should look up what they are. There's something really great about cork. Um, I forget exactly what they're called. They're like, they're the, um, L. Bean was the only company that made them for a while. Now a lot of companies made them. They're those slippers that have like the cork insole on them. Really good, really comfortable. I think those are great. Um, um, and the only problem with those is they're a little bit more of a winter. Uh, slipper uh, might be a little bit too hot for the summer months. So in the summer months, I think you can wear a good indoor, a sandal after indoor, like a Birkenstock that has a nice cork, uh, soft um, uh, insole. So I have a question here uh, on stress fractures. Can stress fractures be caused by osteoarthritis or osteoporosis? <clears throat> Generally, stress fractures um, are not caused by osteoarthritis. Um, but they certainly can be caused by osteoporosis. Osteoporosis is a loss of uh, bone density, uh, and people with osteoporosis are uh, certainly at elevated risk uh, to stress fracture. As a matter of fact, um, people who repeatedly stress fracture, people who see, you know, maybe uh, this summer and they develop a stress fracture and then they're not too active through the fall and winter and next summer stress fracture another bone, we'll often send them for bone density testing because uh, osteoporosis is a, a common cause of a stress fracture. All right, I have a history of plantar fasciitis. What should I be looking for in a sneaker? Tough question to answer, um, but I'm gonna do my best. And the reason it's a tough question to answer is because that depends a little bit on your foot structure. Um, so um, if you have a high arch foot or a flat foot, um, 
in general, though, I recommend um, a good arch support in a sneaker, and there are some good recommendations on that. Um, again, if you think about what the what plantar fasciitis was, that ligament straining, right? That ligament needs to be supported in the middle. So, uh, really good arch supports. Um, I'm a big. Uh, you had, the question was, what should I look for in a sneaker? If you're jogging um, or walking, or, or there's different uh, types of sneakers. But in general, I like the uh, jogging sneakers. I'm a big Brooks fan. Uh, Brooks Ghost, B-R-O-O-K-S, is the running sneaker that I like the best. Uh, and their Ghost model is really good for plantar fasciitis. Uh, New Balance also may, has a, a very good line. Asics has a very good line. Um, but you want to look for um, a sneaker with good arch support. I'm not a big fan of the minimalist sneakers when it comes to people with plantar fasciitis. I think some people can get away with minimal, minimalist sneakers, but I think somebody with plantar fasciitis definitely wants something uh, a little bit more supportive. <clears throat> Can the bone density test of the hip or spine indicate problem in the foot as well? So yeah, the, 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 when you have a bone density test, that's where it's done on uh, hip and spine. It's, it, the foot isn't tested for the bone density. So the diagnosis of osteoporosis um, comes from the, the bone density test and then, and, you know, osteoporosis can lead to stress fractures and, and some foot problems. So indirectly, yes, bone density uh, test in the hip and spine uh, can indicate that uh, you are prone to stress fracture in the foot for sure. Because uh, again, the most common stress fractures are um, the, the tibia or the shin bone and the second metatarsal in the foot. So having a poor bone density or osteoporosis can definitely lead to uh, a fracture of one of those bones. Uh, would people with flat feet be more prone to have plantar fasciitis? They are. Um, so if you think about the arch of the foot, um, I don't know if I can be seen on the screen. Let's try it. So this is the foot from, I don't know if I can see that or not. I'm just going to try and demonstrate that. The foot from the side. Um, the plantar fascia runs along the bottom of the foot, right? So when the foot is flat, that plantar fascia, fascia has to stretch a longer distance. So it's constantly under tension, under strain. So people who have a flat foot are, are just, are definitely more prone uh, to plantar fascia because the, the, the plantar fascia the ligament just works harder to support the flat arch and, and it tends to, to become inflamed and, and tight uh, more frequently than uh, patients with normal arch height. Can I please repeat the sneaker brand? Sure. Sorry. So um, again, the sneaker running sneaker brands are so sophisticated now that they all have their line. Um, they all have multiple lines, I should say, one for flat feet, one for neutral or cushion, one for high arch feet. Uh, but some of the better brands, uh, in my opinion, are Brooks, B R O O K S, Asics, um, New Balance, uh, and uh, Mizuno. M I Z U N O. Uh, those, and and I'm, I'm sorry, I forgot one of my favorite ones, Saucony, S A U C O N Y. Uh, those, I think, um, are really, really uh, quality uh, sneakers. All right, everybody. Well, I think that's it. I don't see any more questions. Thank you, everybody, for joining. Have a, have a great night. Thank you very much.